Hello, hello. Welcome to Music Corner Symphonizing live stream episode four. It's a nice Tuesday. It's very windy where I live in Northeast Ohio. And so there's lots of noise of things moving around outside. But uh, so today, I've got uh, two more moments from symphonies to talk with you about for the first hour here. And in the second hour, we'll continue with our very in-depth look at Beethoven 1, bar by bar. I'm going to look some more at the progression in the second sort of four bars. <laughs> yeah, I'm laying a lot of groundwork. So... Anyway, if this is something that interests you, for the very few people who are so far have actually watched any of the bits of the live stream at all, let me know in the comments or uh, share this, I guess. Yeah. So I'm just going to keep going. There was, what was the other thought about that? It was sharing. Yeah. Anyway. So. We're going to look at Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, uh, the ending of the first movement. I mentioned the this section of the Berlioz Symphony yesterday when talking about the end of the first movement of Sibelius's third symphony. So I um, I figured that we could actually just look at the Berlioz section. It's another way of looking, another way of doing a plagal ending after the big main cadence of the piece. The, the movement. Um, then we'll look at the very opening of Carl, ne Carl Nielsen's Symphony Number no. 4, which uh, just begins like a bat out of hell. So uh, I didn't actually know where to stop making the reduction because there's no clear arrival point until you're a few minutes in. So just it's berserk for a while. So it, the inextinguishable translated into English from the Danish. So Nielsen's my favorite composer, so we'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, so without any further ado, because apparently that phrase came into my brain, let's take a look at the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. So um, this is from about 1830, so just right after Beethoven. Um, Berlioz was a music critic during a good portion of his life, um, so he we have him writing about his interest and support of playing Beethoven in Paris, in France, where he's from. And uh, so uh, Berlioz kind of comes out of an interesting part of the world when it comes to being a composer in France in the 19th century, because the big thing to do at the time was to write operas for the Paris Opera, and uh, they wouldn't let many people do that because they wanted to make money. So he had uh, worked really hard to try to get... He, he, wanted, he did write a couple of operas, which we actually play now, but they didn't really do much with at the time. Um, his Trojans opera got lovingly um, mangled there. <laughs> you know, this is decades later, because Berlioz lived... Uh, so like the 1860s or 70s, I can't remember exactly. So, um, but so this is from more earlier in his life. It's it's a really famous thing. There's a whole story about the, you know, that it's picturing a, a particular person who's in love with this woman, and there's this melody that comes back over and over again that portrays her in some way across these various different things. It's a lovely set of ideas. I'm going to talk about the music, the notes on the page. Um, and if any of that seems relevant, I'll bring it up. So uh, the very opening of the first movement, which here in the French original, so Symphony Fantastique. So when we think about fan, fan, the fantastic symphony, it doesn't really mean like great as in fantastic. It's really kind of more like a, we're dealing with sort of a, a magical things. So that sort of, uh, it's a really, we have that meaning in English of the word fantastic, but it's pretty old and archaic. So anyway, so we're dealing with something very kind of 
otherworldly. It's probably a good word for it. So the first movement is uh, titled uh, Rêverie, Passion. So that's uh, visions and passions. So we're, we're, we're literally dealing with dreams here at the beginning. So it has a slow introduction to a sonata form movement that's kind of, that's a kind of a strange idea of what he end, how he ends up doing it. But uh, the, I'm not going to get into the introduction because it's actually pretty long. And just so you know, the Ber Berlioz was uh, very particular about what he wanted to have happen and he wanted to make sure that the notes he wrote actually got played. So he wrote long notes like this one right here which is it's, it takes up more of the score because this is an edition that's in three languages so anyway from a long time after his death so anyway so long intro it's really nice and then we get the the pivot into the fast section and then it immediately pivots into the main tune which i'm going to play so this is a g pickup here and uh can i zoom not really because it's so long so anyway very long melody page just confirm yep there it is so that's the flute and the violins there so it's a very big long melodic singing tune and this is the the fancy term uh i don't want to write it in french the the, the basically it's just like you know, it's the main motive is this very long melody and so berlioz himself called it a fixed idea, ide fixe. Did he actually come up with that term? Somebody else said. I don't remember. I think it's from the program, though. Yeah, the program you wrote for the original performance. So, um, <clears throat> so the um, so after that happens, and there's a, a long. So it's it, there's it's it's a sonata form movement, and so that tune functions as the primary theme. And so it goes along for a while. There's a, all the normal stuff. So it winds up, and so we get after a long time. So this is the main, this is the page where I'm going to start the recording, the, the, the reduction I made. So it's literally these this big chord right here, and then this chord, these chords, you know. I start there, not this lead up. And then there's this little transition to the slow and the slower ending where it's got a kind of chorale feel. So the music will start right around here. So take a listen to the end. It's not letting me change pages. So there you go. So uh, I'll play some of it again, but the, um, so what happens here at the very, right before the long section here at the end, is this is the big, this is the big final cadence right here in this, uh, where the fortissimo half note is. So this is the very, this is the this is the place that you're trying to get to to so that you can then kind of wind down from afterwards. So this is the big important cadence. So I, so I talked about with the Tchaikovsky on the in the second episode, the Tchaikovsky five, about the I just looked directly at the big cadence at the end of the very whole symphony, which uh, late Romantic composers tend to really emphasize, 
the arrival at the very end of the symphony and kind of are less interested in making the H movement have its own equally as strong arrival point, sort of make the whole symphony tie together in some sense. It's a less of an less of an idea in this time, although Beethoven kind of starts that possibility in some of the symphonies. So here um, is the big cadence for the first movement. And I'm going to just play the six bars or so of that here. That's written out here. And so, you know, if he really wanted to, we could just go boom, you know, play that chord and stop. But most, most big fancy public pieces like this are going to have a lot of music after such a thing. So... So uh, if we do a little bit of analysis here, I'm going to zoom in. Most of the stuff at this point is the same across the staves that I've made. Let me zoom in even more. Okay. So here, I need a text thing. Yeah, let's, let's, let's grab that Roman numeral crap again. I have got re great reverence for Roman numeral analysis. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, the the so we're in C major, and this is a big G major chord here. That that the big wind up is to before we get the little loops to the last couple of chords here. So where was I looking? Okay, I need format, and I need to change it to twenty so it's big enough. Scroll down a little bit. Okay. So let's do let's do something like this. Put that over here. So we're in C major. And I said last time that I wasn't sure what key this was in when I was looking at the Sibelius shows today. And guess what? They're both in C major. So the plagal kind of thing carries across and it's going to be easier to see because all the notes will be very similar in terms of where they go. But very different way of doing it. Okay, so we have a G, a G triad, and then in this little bit here, so this is a C, E, and G. So two beats later, there's a one chord as we uh, slowly descend. So this is a G, C, that's still C major. There's a G on the bottom. So that's a, I'm going to... I'm gonna do this. No, no, I'm not gonna do that. Here you go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make some people angry. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. If you don't know why people would be angry that I did that, you'll uh, you're better off in your life. Okay, so that's G. And then there's uh, this is C. C E G uh, C and C and E, excuse me. So that's a one. And then there's just a G here. So there's kind of an implied. I'm putting that in brackets. So it's an impl implied five chord there. I should talk about implied in some sense. So let me let me write this down for a moment here. Implied chord. Okay. That'll be a reminder for me to say something about that. So then, so that's all pretty straightforward if I just play that part here. Right? So it's it sounds to me like 5 1 then there's a cadential 6 4 chord 5 1. And then a another lead in 5 to go somewhere else or to reconfirm 1. And instead of and instead of uh getting on this me, there's a E in the melody. That's why that's the piccolo note. It's also in the first violin here. First violin E. This is an E minor chord, and so Berlioz's particular way of handling harmony is very much in effect in this moment. So, like the, like in the Sibelius, there there's three chords near near cadential arrival points, and then just in case if you're really not sure that you really wanted an E minor chord there. The sm the the soft thing is the G major 5. Right, so let me go back here and 
if I write all this out in a way that makes any sense. Okay, so I wanted to call this, call this C, and this is C over G, and uh, G, and that's C. And then here is E minor, and then G major. And then in this moment right here, the big, F, the big forte is a C major chord again. So that's kind of cool. The, so he inserts in the very last cadence right before the 5-1. The this is 5-1. That's kind of nice. He inserts leading into that five a three in root position chord. So me, so there's a E in both the melody and in the bass in this moment. And so that gives it. There's a particular character that starts appearing around this time. Is a, what I'll, I'll call the. So if you take any theory courses, music theory courses, they're going to tell you that, and when you get to a cadence. That is the end of a phrase, or especially here in like a major cadence in the piece, you know, this is um, near the end. That the melody is going to go, it's going to do something like T to Do, that is in this key, B to C, or Re to Do, Re to Do, Re to Do. I'm silly, I'm sorry. So let's let's do this one. Re to do, which is D to C. And there are even times when both the melody and the bass will go so do, so so do, so do, uh, which would be G to C. Um, you can see this in some some particular kinds of cadences in Schubert or Beethoven piano sonatas or something. So it happens sometimes. I did the, one of the examples we were looking at yesterday. Did exactly this. I didn't emphasize it. Not in the Beethoven, in one of the other pieces. And um, so, but what ends up happening in the 19th century, and this is all over sort of Timpan Alley, so 19th century melodies. So I'm thinking of. I'm, I'm let me let me say this in an organized way. So I'm thinking of like Mendelssohn likes this or Schumann, and so on. And it just becomes more and more so that you see it, it's it's all over the place, of doing a Mi, Do cadence. So instead of going Mi, Re, Do, it goes Mi, Do, right at the very end. And this is something that's very common in the 20th century, especially in, so I said Tin Pen Alley, so that's the Great American Songbook, you know, old jazz tunes, these kind of things. So melodies that end me do, and uh, like uh, we looked at, I looked at Amy Beach, uh, her symphony, a section of that. This again happens all over the place in Amy Beach's music too. So it's just like a, a characteristic of the style of music of the last couple hundred years to have. Um, it just sounds really nice to do me do over even over a five chord because there's no there isn't an E natural in a G major chord. So it's how you end up dealing with that that makes specific kinds of choices. So he's kind of playing with that possibility here. Um, notice that it actually goes mi, ti, do with if you have the soft, if you include the soft chord. Actually the, the um, actually this is the, this is the piccolo here sounds up an octave from written so there's an e b c that's the that's the highest voice so e so mi ti do mi si do all right so um okay so and what's interesting about berlioz's harmonic choices sometimes is that he purposefully will harmonize some chords with a root position chord that a German composer at this time would never do.
right? So Beethoven is not really going to use three in this context. Um, he'll use three chords, but not not like this in a major key. So the important thing here to notice is that we're gonna we have a three five one cadence, which is actually quite rare. Uh, let me let me write it like that, and I just think it sounds really nice. Yay! So that's the big cadence. So once we get that thing to happen, now we can do the slowly relaxing of the piece and have other things happen. So from there, so uh, uh, Berlioz includes a uh, ritardando poco a poco. Um, so we're slowly, little by little getting slow, low, uh, little by little getting slower. And what the violins and violas do is they arpeggiate through different harmonies, just going from up to go. This is an Alberti bass pattern, if you know them. So the Alberti bass is you start on the bottom note of the chord, you go up to the top note, you go up to actually. What am I? My brain is not working anymore. So the basic idea of an Alberti bass is that you start on the you start on the bottom note and then you arpeggiate up from it to the other note in the chord sometimes in, in a particular order and the the actual order is escaping my brain at the moment. Anyway, so this is a similar idea. So we go from the bottom note up to the next note, go back to the bottom note, go up to the top note, and come back down. And that happens a bunch of times. And here so we go through our so this is a C major chord with G on the bottom. So there's sort of a dominant pedal effect for the beginning here. So there's, uh, ooh, that's kind of cool, but not what I wanted. That's nice. All right, having trouble today, like every day. Okay, so that goes on for two bars. So that's all C major. So we get. Okay, then, then that becomes a minor triad by moving the E flat down. Okay, then he steps down from there and does, and there should be a way for me to do two half diminished seven. Two, uh, so this is a two diminished, he goes, he moves to a D, F, A flat chord, so that's two diminished six. And then that one goes to everyone's favorite. There's a Neapolitan triad here, uh, D flat, F, A flat, and in, in first inversion. So I need a big, big flat, a two and a six. All right, so we go from. speeds up that change by one and just in case if you're getting tired of the predominant it keeps going there's a minor four F a flat C and then and then that becomes in the last bar with this B natural becomes a seven fully diminished chord what is that the O so if I do should be able to do option O. Ooh, that was cool. Now oh, I have a specific keyboard on. So if I do that one. Ah, there it was. Okay, finally. I found where the half diminished symbol was finally. I needed that a couple of days ago. All right. So let's. Okay, so it's Apple O. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, Apple O shift. Yes, okay. So now I know the keyboard shortcut. So that is a, that's a four, three. And then that moves immediately into, moves immediately into a five, seven, with the, with the F there. And the A flat moves to G. This is all very smooth. This is a very normal 
progression like this. And then we get emphasizing G with some F sharps like in the Beethoven we've seen. And then the tune returns, just a little wisp of it. Yeah, so just a little bit of it. So this is a C major chord, that's one. And then it goes up. And then there's a, a five here. And then we get the fun part. So let's, let's put that in there. That's one. And then there's B and F here, B and G, which gives us five. And then this, um, all the notes here are in, all the notes are basically in the strings. So the, um, so we have F, A flat, and C. So notice that we pivoted through C minor sounding harmonies here, right? Moving to a minor, a C minor triad, to a D half diminished, D, D, uh, D flat major Neapolitan harmonies tend to mostly happen in minor because you only have to add the D flat. Minor four, as, and then the B fully diminished with A flat. Then we get our B7, a G7 chord, which could be anything. Then F sharp kind of brightens a little bit, and then we go back to C major again. So we're in, we're in the land of C major on this fa, and there's a B and a G, and then it moves immediately. And then it moves immediately to our four chord here in minor, F, A, flat, C. This is a minor four. So we've got, that's a cool thing that happened. That's not what I wanted. I wanted F minor. Okay, and that goes to C, E, and G. That goes to C major. And then we get F with a ma an A natural, so that's major four. And then we go back to C major in this chord here. We go back to F major. And then we go back to C major. And then we get three more C major chords. So it's interesting to notice that's that's an interesting set of things that happens here. So we go, we do this passage through C minor to get back to the opening main melody, the fixed idea, the idée fixe. I just didn't want to write it in French because I can't remember where the, if there's an ac I think there's an accent in idée. Then five, but then there's the immediate slip to minor four. That's kind of cool. And the reason that this is possible, so this is the, the fancy term is retrogression that music theorists talk about. This is that you don't really usually have five go to four, especially to a minor four, but what's actually happening is that this is again, this is kind of an implied five sound here because there's no bass, it's just the two melody notes. So what happens is they both move up by half step. G goes to A flat and B goes to C. G goes to A flat and B goes to C. Let me put this, that above it because it happens above that. So that that's a very smooth movement up. And then you just plop an F underneath them. <laughs> so there's you're not going to cause any voice leading problems because there's no... The reason you want to avoid that is because you might get like parallels parallel octaves or parallel fifths or something. And it's not a problem if you just throw the, add the F afterward. So it's this movement of. Let me actually play good notes here. So we get that minor coloring that we heard before, just a little bit of the F minor. And then we go back to 
F, when we flip and back and forth between F and C. So this is the plagal ending of minor 4 and major 4 alternating with C major. And so the reason that C major, the and the reason that sounds really nice, again, is because there's another place where you get a mind, both uh, two voices a third apart going down a half step. So that A flat goes back down to G, but the new F, except in, where, um, in voices other than the bass, actually in the bass too, this is, a, I, I, missed, I missed some interesting information here, that the bass originally the first time goes to E, so it's a 1 6 chord. This is C over E. I remember analyzing that yesterday. So, there we go. Or when I type, yeah, earlier today. That was a few hours ago. So, notice that, that that's the way you get. So, the B and G go up a half step to A flat and C, and then the A flat and F go down a half step to E and G. And so that, that very smooth half step voice leading. I made that smooth chords video a long time ago about how to write interesting chord progressions. And so one of them is this minor four to one option that's available at the end of a piece of music. I actually give that as an example. So once once you get to the end of the big the last big cadence that goes dominant to tonic, you can start playing around playing around with minor four chords. So all right, so I, I wrote that I needed to do something about implied chords. So okay. So let me let me let me give a little disquisition on this idea. So I'm organizing my brain here. All right. So the world So, if you know anything about music at all, just like if you have the bare bones normal human being American or another society knowledge about music. You know, you've you've heard two words in your life that are technical. Melody and chord, or the equivalent, right? Or talking about harmony. That's another word that goes here. And what we're talking about with melody is a single line that does this thing. So that long melody that Berlioz wrote. Um, so, so, do, so, si, ti, di, do, ti, di, la, so, so. I'll make sure that, yeah, am I in the right place? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you have re mi re do si do. That's right. It's so do so so mi fa fa mi re re do do si and so on. I'm playing some of the rhythms wrong, but anyway, that's a melody. One person sings it, one person plays it on one instrument. It's just there's one note at a time, and you play them through. And it sounds really cool. Lots of different interesting rhythms. It's the thing that sticks in your head. It's what the earworm would be, all those kind of things. And then you have this idea that there are other notes that happen at the same time. So you play the guitar, and you play, you you make you do make the weird claw with your hand, and you play zhuang, and you get an chord. Or you learning the keyboard, and you're like, okay, you play three notes at one time, C major chord. Yay, here's a G major chord. Here's an F major chord. You know that if you play three notes at once, you'll get a chord. So, um, if you spend any time thinking about music uh, in a sort of a more philosophical sense, you'll realize that we're making this up. <laughs> that these ideas are so the mu humans are creating the music, right? But we're also making up the terms to organize the music. It's not. It's not like, uh, you know, someone decided one day, hey, I want to make up something that I'm going to call a chord. It's, it's not how people do things. I mean, uh, pretty rarely, um, in terms of like, we all do this together. It's really more of a question of. I'm singing something. You should sing something too. Are you going to sing the same thing? Maybe. I mean, there's a whole slew of uh, of human uh, musical cultures around the world where they don't have they don't, they don't deal with this idea. Their whole idea thing is, well, you're going to play the tune, and I'm going to play the tune at the same time, but we're going to do a bunch of extra stuff around it because that's the thing we do. 
and we're all going to do that at the same time. And so everybody's ornamenting, everyone's playing a bunch of lots of different notes at the same time that are not exactly the same at the same time. And it sounds really cool and it's really great. And so they don't need to make their music with this idea of a chord or a harmony. I mean, they can add it if they want to, but they don't need it conceptually. So it means that the, the long process of getting two chords, as we would think of them, like that a guitar player would play or that you would, you know, you stick down three fingers on a piano keyboard. I mean, it takes a long time in the history of ideas to get to this idea. So there's music that's already existed for a long time in the Western tradition that is using a lot of people singing at once and they're singing completely different lines on purpose, chosen to do so, either making it up on the spot or uh, decided on beforehand. Both of those things happen, been going on for a long time. And uh, the idea that the thing that happens when you're all singing at the same time, different notes, that that's a thing, it takes a while for that idea to come about. So it means that when you get into the tradition of making even classical music like this, that clearly there are chords. I mean, you know, uh, you know, people are writing books that include the concept of this already, a long time in France, other places. That the musical tradition goes back far enough that some of the ways that they choose to write music doesn't easily align with this very basic concept of chord. Meaning, you don't always have three notes going on at once. So if there aren't three notes, what do you do? I mean, so if you're going to sit down in our society and you're going to write a P, you write a song, You'll come up with a tune, maybe, if you, that's one way you can do it. Sometimes people come up with a chord progression first and then write a melody to go with it. That's already so baked into the idea of chord that you're going to get something else. That you're going to get only this kind of thing. The chords are baked in. But if you're writing classical music to her 300 years ago, you're not really worried about that as much. You care. But that's not the guiding concept in the way we think about it. So it means that there are plenty of times when there aren't three notes. Because it's more important that these two lines, they fit together in all these different ways. That's the, you know, the, the way that they systematize this idea is something they call counterpoint, which is literally, you know, point against point. You know, it's like you're doing this thing, and when you do this thing, and then if I go, this one goes over here, then this one's going to go over here. Right? So it's like a, it's almost like a puzzle. But if you do this long enough and you sit and you're a child and you're learning to do this over 20 years, you know how to do this on the fly, which is something we're not really, we don't really teach people to do anymore. Uh, generally, we like to have children have lives separate from the craft they might learn <laughs> to make money when they're an adult. So, um, and there isn't much call for uh, 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 the kind of... Uh, local music directors of 200 years ago in Europe, in European culture, in Europe now, or <laughs> in the United States or anywhere else around the world. So it kind of slowly died away. Uh, we don't need to create those kind of people anymore. So it means that when we're looking at this old music, there are not going to be times when it's just like, there's a chord here. And, there, and so what we can do is that, so then from there, all of that, after all that long stuff, I can say this. So then means that even in the 19th century, they have this point where they're like, but we have this idea of chord, what are we supposed to do? And so a good example of this, how this becomes part of the, the zeitgeist of creating music, sort of around the same time, is that the very well-known Bach, uh, written in the you know mid-18th mid century, 100 years earlier, the Bach cello suites. Robert Schumann wrote an accompaniment for piano to play with this, the cello suites. Bach didn't write for cello plus, he just wrote a cello piece. And so what they did is they took the chords that, the, that Bach was implying. Bach was writing with chords, but in a different sense. And he wrote chords underneath it. 
It's an interesting choice, but you know, it just goes to show you how much the style changed in just 100 years there. So it means that Robert Schumann was taking the cello piece that's implying in his mind certain harmonies, which is it's doing. That's what he was taught how to do. That's how his ear works, how his brain works. And so he added them to the, to the cello piece. Uh, there's a piano piece I learned many years ago by, um, what's his name? Franz Liszt, Constellation Number no. 3. It gets played all the time. And in the edition I was playing it from, that's like, has from the 19th century, and that was the, an editor added at the very end two chords because this whole piece, it goes all the way down in this upper register. What key is it in? Something like this. I'm just making it up. And there's no harmony because the, the, the bass ended a long time ago. And so there's this really romantic late style made up last two chords to go with the very end. I mean, just like Liszt didn't do that. So even Liszt, <laughs> who knew how to write chords, um, need, they needed to add some to his music. You know, it's like, because we need harmony, right? We need to make it clear that this is the end, right? So, so it's this concept of if I have one note, what other notes does it tell me that should go with it? And the answer is lots of different possibilities. Some are more likely than others. So when you have only a couple of notes, you're not exactly positive about what the role of these notes might play. And that's where you can then mess with which options are happening, right? So this move here from B to G, B and G, which kind of sounds like five, sliding up to this minor four chord makes perfectly logical sense melodically but if you go sit and read a music theory textbook going from that kind of five sound to this kind of four sound is a pretty rare idea even to the point that they'll say it might break the rules quote unquote but keep in mind that Berlioz loved to do this kind of thing anyway breaking rules as it were I don't know if something like that's happening anyway, but this is not that this is not this this is not that weird. It's also at a phrase boundary, and there are more less rules about how you do you go from one phrase to another. So, all right, so that's that's ten minutes on something I shouldn't have talked about. But anyway, <laughs> so just so you know. I put Roman numerals on other stuff because I know all of this information I just said. And so the Roman numerals mean something to me outside of a stack of notes all at once. They mean this voice leading over here, like four going to one six means more to me than F, A, and C going to E, G, and C. It means more things to me than that. It means the F goes to E. It means the voice, the voice leading is there. It means that the, that the A flat will go to G. It means these kind of things. Those are baked in the meaning of this group of Roman numerals in my head. Separate from, so it's like, uh, so when they teach you in classes just to add Roman numerals to things, if you don't have any context for why you're adding those Roman numerals, it doesn't mean anything. But these Roman numerals mean something to me because I know what's going on and what, uh, how I should arrange the notes to get the particular style to take place. Because the Roman numerals are just are just a late are just a in the end a, a mnemonic for how the music would end up happening. That's all it ends up being, really. And so I, I'm you know some people are you know want other systems of analysis to better explain what's going on, and it's like well, remember that the symbols whatever we use them are just a fill in for all this other information that we know otherwise, right? So it's it's part of the reason I'm here is I want to be able to access this information I have in my head already and build more of it from looking at the stores directly rather than going um, I have enough information and enough intuition about this music to be able to not need to go through somebody else's writings about it because that's you know I'm, I'm going back as close as I can to what's what the sources of this is luckily they wrote things down <laughs> okay Okay, that gives me 15 minutes to talk about Nielsen here. So, anyway, lovely plagal ending. Love Berlioz. Cool piece.
the way he handles music is a little different from the Germans during this time, and that's interesting. It's also different from the way a lot of French people wrote during this time, but we don't care generally about those humans. So they don't we don't talk about them. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I might, I'm going to talk about one of the people who was very important in France in this time, uh, yesterday, t uh, tomorrow, uh, Luigi Carabini, who was running the um, uh, was running the Paris Conservatory at the time. He was an uh, Italian composer. So, Nielsen. So we're going to go ahead about 80 years. This is like World War I time period or so. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. So, my favorite composer. And uh, so this is probably his most famous symphony. Uh, number four, the inextinguishable. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce this Danish word here, these Danish words here, because Danish is a particular pronunciation that I have nowhere close to knowing how to do. So, but... Uh, the important thing, the thing I've written here is that, you know, I took Latin in high school. And uh, one of the things I learned at the time studying the Aeneid, one of the things I learned studying the Aeneid was that, um, you know, it starts in the middle of things. And so there was a term came up with for it that's in Latin, in medias res, you know. In, uh, let me make sure I did that right. In, in, in medias res, yeah. So the... Um, so it's just it starts in the middle of a the the story gets to, they're in the middle of a um, a storm uh, on the on the Mediterranean Sea, and then most of this a lot of the story of the Aeneid is told in uh, in reflection. It's like oh well this is how we got here. So but it's like so you immediately start with something really um, uh, uh, captivating rather than going. Well, hello there and uh, so well I'm gonna tell you this story about this and we're gonna do that although there is that there is the slightest bit of introduction you know I sing of arms in the man anyway but so the opening scene is is not the very beginning of the story in Troy where you know the the um, it's interesting I'm talking about the Aeneid in this because this is a very important story to Berlioz <laughs> anyway so the basic idea is that there's this concept of not starting with an introduction, but starting with right in the middle of the action, right? It would be starting a movie immediately with a war, like in the middle of a war scene, rather than the story of how the guy started to get there. You know, the, you know, you follow a specific character who's going to go off to war, and then there's the period where he's at the war. No, it's the very first thing that happens is some, you know, is some gunfire, and he's in the trench. You know, it's in World War One or whatever, right? I mean that's the way that's that's a that's a in medias race beginning in the middle of things so here's what it sounds like I, I, I enjoyed making this little reduction here but it's just gonna go for a while and uh, it's it's just all over the place it's great <laughs> Sorry, uh, I was sitting here laughing while making it because it's just so it's just so bonkers. But uh, so this is this is not a this is not full of repose. Let's put it that way. So um, relatively big orchestra, th triple winds. So there's two flutes, piccolo, three oboes, three clarinets, three three bassoons, and there are four horns, three trumpets, uh, three tr uh, three trombones, a tuba, and there are two timpani players. Um, the second timpanist doesn't come in for a very long time, but uh, according to the note here, which uh, if I read the Italian, oh, so let's see, this is this is in. So that's uh, there's, let's let's read this closer up here. All right. <clears throat> 
Uh, so there's there's the Dutch, there's the Danish, and then there's the German in Fraktur. That is the well, it's actually yeah, sort of. And then Italian. So the best I can do is the Italian. You post the second timpani directly, and the and the first symphony is so the extreme of the orchestra in the vicinity of the auditorium. So not he doesn't want timpanis in the back of the back of the orchestra. He wants them up, right up front. And can you imagine going to an orchestra concert and their timpanis right up front, and the and in the very first moment, like like the second measure is him going slam slam. You know, it's like a bunch of times. It's a very different experience. So it's intended to be visually captivating in some way. But they, they have the dueling timpani part later, in, which is kind of cool. So, but breaking this thing down is very hard. And I don't even know what to make of half of this. So, so it's got a one flat key signature. And the first note is a is, so that's a B flat, right, in the key signature. And the very first note is in the trombones, the tuba, and the strings. And it's a B natural grace note going to C. That's the very first thing that happens, B to C. <laughs> so it's like, well, we have a key signature, but it doesn't matter right now. But uh, there's a little more sense to what the one flat key signature might mean. Could be B, F major, could be D minor because there's a D minor chord, two Ds and an A, in the trumpet, in the trumpets. That's here. And then there's an, and then the horns play this F, F sharp, A. So we got D and A. Let's, let's do this way, so D, A. And then below that is F, F sharp, A. Right, so, so it's this gesture. So that's what's going on. And uh, the woodwinds, which you usually can't hear because the horns are blaring so loud at the very beginning, the woodwinds play a, play a D minor arpeggio going up, then they play a D major arpeggio going up and arrive on A. Ba -da -da, ba -da -da. Hmm. So there's some sense of D, maybe, in the first bar. And then, by the way, this is while, while that C is holding, by the way. That C has been going on forever. <laughs> so there's sort of a, a D minor 7 feel and then a D, D dominant 7 feel. And then the woodwinds go a, do a D E flat grace note. So we're taking our D seven and going, making a minor nine out of it. And they do a D flat to E, D flat to E flat to A, and they and they grind on that D to E E flat to A tritone a bunch of times. So there's. And just in case, if you're worried, the the timpani also gets really into the act of hitting the A's and the the A's and the E flats, alternating. He alternates with the E. Have I ever seen a woman play the timpani? There must have been times in my life. Can't think of one off the top. Yes. Okay. There it goes. I found one. High school band. Okay. But yes, the human who plays the timpani plays A's and E flats. I'm thinking of my going to the Cleveland Orchestra and the timpanist for a very, very long time was a, while I was, well, uh, as I've been alive, has been a very great uh, gentleman and his assistant timpanist was also a gentleman. So, um, yeehaw. That's what I'm thinking of in my brain. I live in Cleveland. <laughs> Cleveland Orchestra is really good. And I've heard them play this. It was really great. A long time ago. Actually, I think a couple of times. Anyway, so... E flat, D, E flat, A, D flat, A, while the C is holding. So there's sort of this D, D dominant nine feel, minor nine, right? So I, I talked about with the, um, the Tchaikovsky moment there of that uh, dominant nine chord, which luckily happened to be, well, it was an F sharp dominant seven, and it had a major nine on top of it, which would be the equivalent of E natural here. 
So that's what we're dealing with. This is actually much, you know, I, I don't remember having this much information about this piece last time I looked at it. So I'm actually making progress in my analysis of this piece today. I'm, I'm pleased. So what happens next is that the woodwinds will go off into this uh, triplet runs, uh, staying in this group of notes. So like the Beethoven First Symphony I've been looking at the past couple of days, so uh, we're moving between the chord tones in some sense. Are we? Maybe? Not really. It's hard to know. So the arrival note there is an, the A, like the E flat A. So this is like an elaboration of the... So we're going... We go down to A, go down to G, up to C. That's, that's the highest note there. And then back to... And so we do the G, B flat. So like a lower and upper neighbor together. It's called a changing tones in one of in one of our fancy things. So yeah, it's sort of outlining the upper notes of this dominant nine, A flat, C and um, A flat, I'm sorry, E flat, C and A. The strings, um, they, after holding C for a long time, they swipe up to, they do a C sharp to D so that again funk emphasizes D, but so that's a half step higher than the D E flat was, um, a half step lower than D E flat, but so still pitches, but different area of the chord. So that's D going down to, uh, so they do, let's, let's, let's do it over here, racing against time. I'm trying to stay on time today, so I don't go a half an hour over today. So they go down this, so C natural returns. So they arrive on G. So something is changing here with the, um, with the strings there. The woodwinds return and do the same gesture again, or with the E flats, the big swipes to A. The timpanist is emphasizing A, so we're getting some kind of A here. The horns come in with long B flats. So it seems that we're moving to something new, but really, it's, I, you know, this is all, <laughs> it's all a mess in my head. So, so there's a certain sense of, so there's an A on the bottom, and we're getting G and D and B flat. It's, you know, that's, okay, so I, that's, this is where I'm kind of, my brain is going here. There's still the A flat sense, right? So this is, that's B flat. When the trumpets come in, they're playing, they're in C, so that's an F there. And the B flat is still holding, so there's a B flat and an F later, B flat and F. And um, the woodwinds continue with their version of the tone. So this is like multiple things happening at once that don't align, as best I can tell. So the first page will get a little bit more sense, but the second one doesn't at all. <laughs> So I want to I want to listen to some of this just just to see if my ear tells me anything interesting. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. Okay. No, I, I can't. It doesn't make any sense of that. So the. Uh, Let's see what happens here. So on the very downbeat arrival here, so that's arriving a B natural in the woodwinds and G in the uh, G in the strings, and uh, the trumpets, uh, the the horns go down to G. Okay, that's helpful. And then the horn, the trumpet's been holding F, and then they go from F down to D. They hold the F through, and then they go F E flat D. So, so there is kind of a there is kind of a sense of a G seven here. G B D F. Just a little bit, and then this next gesture actually kind of emphasizes C. Yeah, ba 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 C G, C. So that that G makes sense there, and he gets into the G through. The horns go from A flat to G and the strings go from F sharp to G. So that's an augmented sixth resolving to an octave. 
wow that f holds that's fun in the well it's not he gets there the g flat f that's nuts <laughs> Um, and the woodwind's doing this F, F with a lower. So they do C into the B. B. Yeah, wow. And there's sort of a D here, too. So it's kind of a, there's kind of a French augmented six chord sound here, if I ignore the F natural, because there's a D on the downbeat of the woodwinds there they have f here okay f nope the f has been holding for a while okay so the f and f sharp don't really line up this is kind of uh bonk this is kind of bonkers um so the um the um the next thing so I need to pivot to something else now. But anyway, I just wanted to show this and I had some fun writing it down. But so this is a good example of early, you know, 20th century modernism. You know, there are some implications of dominant seventh chords and there are tritones everywhere, but it's lining up in interesting places and how we, uh, where it doesn't really necessarily make any sense because he's really dealing with things that are purposefully contrasting with each other that this is really hard to make any sense of. And um, yeah. Sounds really cool, though. So to uh, uh, the, there's a question in the comments from uh, I'm not going to attempt to see your name. I'm sorry, but uh, they asked me if I'm a composer, and yes, the answer is yes, I'm a composer. I've been for a long time, um, but I'm working on my first symphony. Uh, I have been for a couple of months. I'm working on the last movement in short score now, and so one of the things I, I've been studying symphonies myself. Um, for a while, and they're my favorite genre of classical music. You know, like people like novels, I like symphonies. The um, and I, I I've been studying them, and I figured that I could share this information with other people. So I had this music theory channel from years ago. So I I'm just live streaming here, me doing this and trying to make sense of this myself, and hopefully this will be useful for other people. Send. So, I'm glad that uh, a couple of other people who've commented are also are enjoying this somehow. So, anyway, that's hope. That's that's uh, helpful to me. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's 4:02 where I live. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes, put up a screen, uh, and I'll be back. And uh, then I'm going to go into Beethoven one where I've stopped yesterday. So uh, we'll be looking at measures four through eight some more and uh, looking at the champagne progression that happens in that section. So I'll boil it down a little bit and write something that sounds similar. So I'll be back in a couple of minutes, really just like two minutes.
All right, I'm back. Hello, hello. So the um, so um, before I forget to mention, I um, so I'm I'm doing this every weekday at the moment, um, three to five my time. That's um, Eastern Daylight Time at the moment. So uh, tomorrow for the first hour, I'm going to look at sections from I mentioned the Luigi Cherubini. Uh, his one symphony d major from 1815 kind of uh, it's a good example of what music was like around beethoven's time that isn't like beethoven um so i was i'll show something like that and then i'm going to look at the opening of the last movement of brahms fourth symphony which has a really cool augment six chord in it anyway just the big loud brass chords and then the timpani thing so I'm going to look at some Brahms. I haven't done that yet. So, <clears throat> so where I left off with this Beethoven symphony yesterday was I was making, so we had a little reduction going, and we've gotten through the first eight bars. And so I'm going to just play up to that section in my little recording I made here, the MIDI. And this is the, I'm um, going to play yeah, just the first eight bars in the sound here so we can see it. And then I'm going to talk some about the little second section here that has this where the strings are more, everybody's more continuously playing. My mind wandered during it, so you got to hear the whole the whole introduction. So the so the progression I wanted to look at is what happens. So right after the strings go like this, so this section here. So so boiling this down. So we have a G major chord, a G7 chord, that moves to a G7 over F. Then we go to a C major chord over E. And then that moves to a G7 chord over B, which becomes, at the end of the bar, just G7. There's the slightest flick of a, of a ninth, that is an A. And then we go to one, uh, a C major chord. So if I write that in normal numerals, that's uh, 5, 7 going to 5, 4, 2. This is all in C major. We're in C major most of the time today. And then that's a 1, 6 chord. Then uh, that goes to 5, uh, 6, 5. And back and then 5, 7 to 1. So the basic shape of this is a 5 is going from is going from a so we're going from five to five four two to one six to five six to five to one so I'm just removing some other things and this one this chord progression has a the bit of this chord progression has a fancy name which I've only heard about in the past few years uh, champagne progression just because it's a fancy way to harmonize a particular melodic voice. 
So normal progression would be uh, so one, four, five, one in root position or something, or actually going from one to five to five to one. Th this is uh, something like there are various ways that composers had of using the basic harmonies in various orders and uh, bass and melody patterns to uh, sort of give a grounding to whatever they decided to come up with. And so the reason this is a champagne progression is because of the pattern of the voices on the outside. So the melody here in these few bars, the first measure here emphasizes B. So there's a B there, there's a B at the end of the bar. The most important note in this line is the B. So that's that. Uh, that's the seventh of the chord, uh, seventh of the key, the third of the chord. So that gets emphasized during the first two harmonies, and then that goes up by step to C. And then the champagne progression continues by the move up to D. And then we do a, then we do a cadence that has that going to C there. Actually, does it go to E? There's somebody that goes because it moves up to F. Yeah, to E, so it's giving us an thing. So, but the the basic idea here is the stuff that happens. The stuff that happens here in the first four chords is our champagne progression idea. So the important thing is that this pairs with a bass line of G going to F, going to E, going to B. So it's that, this pattern is that idea. So if I play both voices at once, this is the B voice, B, B, C, D. And then the other voice goes G. So that's G, F, E, B. So I played them together. And if you'll see that the, so in each measure here, so the first two measure, which is the first two chords has B. Then the melody here really emphasizes C really hard. B da 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 da. That's C B C B C B C. Rit D C C. And this is F F. I'm sorry. D F E D C sharp D and so on. So that pattern is gives this. And if we fill it out, the normal way to get this to happen is this these harmonies down here. Uh, five. Five four two one six going to five six. So, just having G a lot, and guess what? Having G in all those chords is exactly what the upper woodwinds do in this section, and um, in the horns. You know, there's the keeping the G constant is what the woodwinds do here, and so they're playing lots of G here. And that a G can continue in the last bar of this as well, which happens in the horns in the next page, if I can get to it. The G's in the horns here. So did I add a pitch over here? No, no, okay. Did I add? I, I made a noise over here, and I'm not sure what it was. Okay. So that progression, which I'm going to now go over here, and I'm going to write this out in note name and pitches so that we can play with this progression. So I'm going to write it in quarter notes. So G, F, um, so G, F, E, B, and then it would go to C as a possibility if it went, if the five, six went straight to something else. And the melody would go B, B, C, D. And then you could go up to E or down to C. Either way is fine. I'm going to go down to C here. So. so notice that I can take a voice and have it sing G the whole time. And that works the whole way. Why is it doing this to me? OK, that's why. OK. I'm going to scroll this over here so you can see, so I'm not having so much trouble. Okay, so let's make it bigger, bigger, much bigger, much bigger. That's big. I like that. That's big. Okay. 
So, and then the only other voice that's available to us, um, if we want to have more things going on, let's see. So, there's that to there. Okay, that's good. All right, so those are the, the basic main ones that we need. So now the, notice that that's incomplete voicing, right? So we have a G, G, and B. I want to add the Roman numerals to this because I'm... So, so we have G, G, and B. So this is just G major. And then this is G, B. This is F, G, and B. So that gives us our G over F, which is a G7 chord. And then we can do, and then the C, E, G, that gives us a fully voiced C major triad. And then here, let's, let's drag this. Oh, okay. Can I do, no. It's just not going to work out. Then we have G, B, and D. So that's a fully voiced G over B chord. And then we just have C, e, C and G. So I would want an E here. I can have the E at the top. And then we get a fully voiced chord. So that's enough information for it to sound like those, three harm those four harmonies. There are five harmonies. Sounds really nice. It's pretty simple. So if I wanted to add a fourth voice to this, I'm going to write it because, let's see, I'm going to write it in the, I'm going to write it on in the treble clef here. So the missing note in my G chord is a D, and then the D can stay for both chords. Then I can have an E here, would be one possibility. Other option is C. If you go back and look in really old keyboard um, like a you know 200 year old keyboard manuals they they would teach you to play c g c in the in the in the right hand here if there's a if there's a an e that you're tells you to play a sixth above it in this circumstance okay and then we would need the b there okay so the and i cannot double that so this would be a c leaping up to g <laughs> So you can, you'd have to put that there. What I can do is have the leap into a seventh here if I wanted. Uh, and so I can smooth out the voicing if I do that instead. So by doing this, it makes me prepare the seventh a little bit better. So it doesn't matter. Any of those is fine. And then that F would go down to E and then that voice would come down if I wanted to have a seventh here. Um, Okay, so let's hear what this sounds like. So what I've done here is, so I'm just going to call this a G7 over F there. Then this has become a G7 over B, like in the Beethoven example. So anyway... Now what we can do is we can take this idea and, uh, and make something sort of like the Beethoven, but not really. And this is the basic thing I wanted to do next. So to show you that I, so to, to, the, we can take this pattern and make something ourselves. That's in this Beethoven symphony. All right, so let's see. Let's pick a key. Pick a key at random here. We're going to go with E flat major. I've been looking at Beethoven's third symphony in my own time, and it's an E flat, so we'll do that. So let's uh, let's pick a. Okay, let me zoom to page height here. Okay, here we go. So we're going to take this and go. Mm, I'm just going to write go. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to choose a tempo marking here. We'll do quarter note equals, uh, we'll do 100. Let's do 96. And I want, uh, let's go with, we'll do, yeah, let's do four. So we'll do four, four here. Okay, an E flat major, it means that, so I'm gonna do half notes um, at this tempo. So this is a, a I'm gonna give a, I'm going to end up using both staves here. So let's zoom in some. 
that's too far. Actually, that'll be fine for now. So what I need here is for the bass voice to go the fifth, five, four, three, seven, one. Five, four, three, seven, one. That's the scale degrees. So in E flat major, the fifth of the scale degree is B flat. So I want B flat, then A flat, then G. Then I want to, I'm going to, do I want to leap down? Either way is fine. No, I want to leap down. So the, the reason that this matters for this style of music, if I could serve sort of something reminiscent of Beethoven, is that for the rules of counterpoint, that is writing a little tune like this, if you have the melody, if you have the bass, go do a fourth leap down and you want to resolve this note, which you're going to need to do because that's a very important note in this key, B. It needs to go to C. So you want to have this fourth leap down and then a step resolution up in the opposite direction. That's what's most likely going to happen. So, so I need to go down to D and then E flat. Okay, so that sounds like this. Okay, and then I'm going to create a line that does this melody pattern. So I want, so this is uh, 7, 7, 1, 2, 1. So in that key, that's D. So D, D, E flat. So I want two Ds, an E flat, an F, and then an E flat. Okay. So now I'm going to make this into something that sounds something real rather than just a, a schematic. So I actually wrote it up here. So let's, uh, let's listen to what the tempo is here. So I can use something similar to what Beethoven does way back here in that he's using passing tones and other and leaping to other chord tones to fill in the space. So let's do something like that. So that would be, let's go with um, D, okay. Let's do, I'm going to do, 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 so that'll work. Um, let's go with, um, da, 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 da. Okay, does that create any problems? That would be parallel, no, that would be parallel fourths there, so that's fine. You can do that. And uh, this is going to become an octave leaping pattern. I'm going to do it in... Eighth notes. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that's why. Uh, I'm I did it the wrong way. Let's do it the right way. And I'm going to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then let's So that should get let me go back to the D to there. Da, ba, da, da, de, da, dum, ba, dum. Let's do put the dotted note there that time. Okay. So this is a will be an E flat major. So let me let me determine what the harmonies would be now. So the first beat here would be B flat. And then this is uh, B flat over A flat, so B flat seven chord. And then here, this is E flat over G. And then we want B flat over D. And then we're going to go to E flat here. Okay. And I can mess with this even more if I want to. But um, okay, so E flat over G. So let's have it do. Now 
let's do that. So I'm going to add a chromatic upper neighbor, like a chromatic passing tone, like Beethoven has done a few times. Let's do it that way. So we'll keep the dotted rhythm pattern. And then we're going to have... So there we go. Woohoo, okay. So I don't like the way that the D here uh, lands against the D here. So what I'm gonna do instead is gonna do like what Beethoven did in this score, which is have it play the, go to the dominant there, the go to a B in root position. So that'll let me do that melodic pattern I came up with. Yeah, so that's that's a little bit better. So now to have something else happen while this is going on. Um, so the octave leaping pattern uh, lets me think of something that's kind of like Brahms, which is we're going to have ba 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 ba. I'm going to do a bunch of syncopation. So my first chord is this. So I have D and F. We'll do D and F. We'll make it uh, make that uh, quarter note, and then that'll do this, and it'll keep going this way. I'm not going to write quarter notes across the bar line, so it's more clear. Um, bum, 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 ba -dum, bum, bum, ba -dum. Let's have them move down to those notes so that we're clear that it's B flat. Um, I'm changing so that there's a B flat very clearly in the second half of the bar that would be missing uh, because it's left the bass voice. Okay, and then I'm gonna, so going to the E flat G, I can, um, so since the G's on the bottom, the D goes up to E flat, I'm gonna write a tie there so that we don't hear the, we get, that the texture continuous so there's no, both notes don't repeat. Okay. And then, so this is F, so we want the E flat here to go to D. And we're going to want this voice here. I want to do a voice exchange between the E flat and the D here. So this is going to break that pattern of the, because we're driving to a cadence, so we want to speed some things up. So that's going to go against that. And then the B flat voice. Is gonna do B flat da 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 da, and then that'll be E flat there. Okay, let's listen to that's okay. That's all the voices now. So here's here's a fourth voice texture with the two inner voices playing a kind of a rhythmic accompaniment. Want to hear this again? Sorry, there's something odd about that I don't like. I'm not sure what it is. So the solution, let's just try that and see what happens. Yeah, then that was the issue. Is It was the D hitting the E at the same time as two E flats. That, that kind of bothered me. So I want to make sure it still sounds like um, B flat major there. So, let's again. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create the, so the clothesline texture that is the long voice is holding the same thing. I'm gonna do this up here. So um, we'll build a, so the th we're gonna have the fifth of the, the root of the B flat chord and the fifth of the E flat chord here. So that'll be, um, so we'll do, um, holding uh, B flat. We'll do half notes at first. Ba, ba, ba. And let's do dotted. Let's do that pattern. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. We'll just do that. See what happens. Okay. 
So now the question is, are there places that I can do something like this? Do, da, da. So having an A natural somewhere. So let's try da, dee, dum, dee, dum. So I'm gonna take A natural here. Let's see what that sounds like. And then I'm gonna Yeah, I'll just do that. How lovely. Okay, now I'm gonna make it more interesting by having this happen in octaves, right? And then I'm going to make it more like a classical period symphony by having what, this is what I'm guessing is wood, a string line, and we'll have the flute play that up an octave. I'm just making up note names, but so, and then, uh, then I'm gonna take the bass pattern here and I'm gonna have that also happen in what would be the equivalent of bassoons here. And so that gives me the, a, a nice full texture here. So let's zoom out. Okay, here we go, here it is. So I could make it weirder if I wanted to, but that's that's a pretty good idea of um, how to take something like Beethoven's um, harmonic progression and melodic voices and to build something that sounds reminiscent, but very different. It's a different tempo, it's a different key, it's got a different melodic line. Um, and the uh, repeated note bass, although that's similar, um, because it's leaping octaves, it doesn't sound exactly the same. So um, by changing a lot of the rhythms and the speed and the key, we cover up a lot of where I'm getting this from. But So this is pretty standard progression. So there's that. Let me know if you have any questions. If you're sitting here watching me, I, I have a, the comments pulled up. So if something shows up, I'll see it. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as I go through doing any of this. All right. Otherwise, I'm going to continue going with the bar by bar analysis here. And so we can actually get to other parts of the symphony than just the first eight measures. So let me, let me throw this back over here. And now we can move on okay so we've gone through the uh, lots of dominant seventh chords in different keys opening we've gone through that champagne progression and this arrival on an imperfect authentic cadence because the melody here goes from let me get back into C major So re fa mi re do re mi fa so la fa mi. I've been working on uh, fixed do solfege recently, so that's why I'm not. I'm doing that instead of movable do, uh, which just means I didn't sing D here. I sang do. Okay. So then, so let me go back to my reduction section here because we're just going to write this in bar by bar. All right, I want to close. That wait okay no I just need to move that somewhere else okay that's what that is got something on the screen in front of my you can't see it but I could okay so now so we're, I I have this C major chord here and so now what happens is we alternate this is measure eight now measure eight maze mesa or measure measure eight okay so. We have, so we have an alternating chords texture. So uh, everybody on beat one, um, so in this measure and in measure, um, and in measure 10, two bars later, let's do that. Okay, 
Got to fix my grammar so that Google doesn't keep giving me low, uh, the squiggly lines. So we uh, that uh, so on on beat one is uh, is an arrival of the previous bar. So everybody plays. Uh, beat two is wins. In this case, the woodwinds and the horns. Well, actually, it's the, it's all the winds. So it's woodwinds and the brass. So the flutes, oboes, bassoons, clarinets, bassoons, uh, trumpets, and horns, and the timpani, timpanist. And then beat. Uh, this is beat two and beat four. And beat three is just the strings. So if we're in a different musical context, we could call this a uh, call and response, but that doesn't really, that, that, that's, that's a very specific uh, uh, characteristic of uh, African-American, um, I can't think of the noun, uh, musical practice. Uh, some people do this and some people do, you know, but it's, it's longer things than just boom, check, boom, check. It's, it's much more elaborate thing. So that, that all this is just one chord here and alternating here. So that's a new texture. Uh, we haven't had this before. Uh, just so you know, that 10, uh, T-E-N period, that's a, an abbreviation for the Italian word tenuto, which means to hold. So basically, notes, the, he's, uh, Beethoven is reminding everyone to play the notes uh, full length. So instead of so generally in class in this kind of style of music, if you just see a note and then a rest after it, you generally play the note a little bit shorter. That's just the way. That's just the natural thing that people end up doing. So if we saw four quarters in a row, if we saw two quarter notes in a bar like this, the like the horn line here, we'd say we do something like bum 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 bum, right? So I'm not I'm not I'm not holding the full value like bum 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 bum. But Beethoven wanted a continuous sound alternating from one to the other. And so he has to tell them to hold the notes full the as long. Long rather than just a northern kind of middle full length a normal quarter note that they would normally play otherwise. So it's so also that this is all um this is all loud. It's all forte. Then there's a different alternation in the next to the next bar. In the measure nine, it's all piano and then crescendos. To forte. Good luck with spelling crescendos as a verb. <laughs> I'm no it, I don't believe that it that's I don't, I don't believe that it should be that, but anyway. Okay, fine, fine. An Italian, or, an Italian word ending in no that I'm using as a verb. Okay, right, it's like spelling tomato, right? Even though tomatoes don't come from Italy. It's, a, it's an originally an American uh, continent plant, like potatoes. So... <clears throat> Look up the phrase Colombian exchange on YouTube. You'll find interesting things. Okay. The um, random random information. So then, so that, and so, and everybody's playing. So everybody, all, all piano. And it's all in the same basic rhythm there. So it's sort of a, the, the term we have, the fancy music theory, the think, musical technical term for everybody plays the same rhythm. It's called homophonic. So homophony. Anyway, that's what they do in measure nine. Everybody plays dum, bum, 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 bum. Right, so everybody's doing some version of that. Uh, they leave out a couple of notes down here, but the, the, it's notable that all the eighth note moving forward is everybody that's playing plays eighth notes there. OK, 
Okay, and measure, uh, as I said, measure, so that was measure 10. It's like measure eight. And then we get, um, and then in measure 11, um, we get the winds uh, play like measure three. So just to remind you what measure three, so they're playing, they play half note, quarter, quarter. That's what the, whole, the woodwinds play. So if I go back to the previous page here, you'll see that exact rhythm in the winds and horn, woodwinds and horns here, quarter, 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 even with the, they're playing all the same pitches mostly, and yeah, nobody changes notes here. And uh, there's the dotted slur there. So we go back. Notice that that happens here too. The clarinets switch voicings to do something for the next bar. But it's basic same texture. The, the new thing is the horns play an arpeggio though. That is, they're playing the three notes of a chord in a row rather than at the same time. And then in measure 12, woodwinds have chords, have half note chords. And the strings play, play scales, woohoo, in octaves and unisons, in octaves. And then, then measure 13 is the beginning of the sonata proper. That is meaning the sonata form in the fast section. So it's fast now. Allegro. Allegro, say it in American accent. Okay. Woohoo, that's the basic texture here. It's important to note here in this measure that everybody's soft, so piano, piano. Uh, that's, that's also true there, but I wanted to write it in this measure. And uh, I should mention there's a diminuendo or a decrescendo from forte to piano across the previous bar. And I did not spell diminuendo correctly. Okay. So, so notice that it's so it's one basic idea, but it alternates a bunch of different things across a bunch of measures. All right, so now we're going to look at it note by note. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so, um, so as I've mentioned in other places, but I want to say again here, when looking at an orchestral score like this and trying to figure out what notes are in it, you want to look... At this, in this style, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Schubert, Mendelssohn, you know, it's not Stravinsky. You want to look at the strings first because they generally have the most important stuff. And then the woodwinds add a melody or long notes or they reinforce the chord that's happening. That's usually what takes place. And then there are special times when the strings are not playing where one line might be happening and then you're looking somewhere else. And generally the reason you want to do this is because the winds, including the brass and the clarinets, often transpose, not in this score for the most part, um, and that just makes it more complicated. And so it's easier to know what the strings are doing and then use that to help you, guide you, if you're trying to look at a B-flat clarinet part and you don't know how to transpose very well. So. It's easier to, it's like, oh, it should be this note. And then you can confirm rather than guess. So, all right. So I'm going to write out the bass line here. So this is the cellos and basses. So it's it sounds like this plus an octave lower. So over here, that's what these two Cs are here. So in the second half of the bar, they have F in octaves. Ooh, interesting. Oh, this is because of the second voice there okay then we have half note G and that ties to an eighth note G and then they play two G eighth notes and then a G sharp and then they go to a 
in octaves, and then then F, and then G. Right. So then, then we look at the viola. This is an alto clef. Middle line is middle C. So that's what this note is here. That's this C here. So we go up a fourth for the F. And so this is all, there isn't gonna be any shifting here. So I'm gonna make that all voice one. Okay, get rid of that. And the tie. I'm gonna remove the second voice rests there. So F. And then they leap down a seventh to this G. So the violas are playing the same notes as the cellos for the next little bit here. So we don't have to write anything new. And then, so on this chord here, they play F, C, F. So it's plus an octave and then there. And then they play this G there. So that's it's easy to get the violas. So I like to go from the bottom up because the violas and oftentimes play something similar to the cellos in some places. So that way I don't have to, I can, it's easier for me to read bass clef. <laughs> I'm an oboe player and I have a lot of time played piano. So it's, um, viola would be the weaker, my, my viola clef, C clef, so would be a little, a little bit weaker. Although I've spent a lot of time with them because that's what I do. Okay, so then we're going to the second violins. They had this G, E here, and then we're gonna do F, um, A, F, and D. And then they move to a low G and an E, and dotted, uh, dotted quarter notes, and then they go up to this G here, and they go G, F, E, and um, D. And then we have C, E, and C, and then F, C, and A, and then G down an octave, E and C, and that G, that open string G, is the same note that the first, uh, the cellos and the and the viola, violas are playing. Let me zoom out just a tad, so we can actually see this whole little passage at the same time. Okay, so then we have the first violins. They play um, E here on the downbeat, and then they play the same chord as the second violins. So that's fine. Then we have C. E, uh, um, G, um, G, E, and then a C on top. And then they play this whole, something exactly the same as the seconds, but up a sixth. So E, E, D, C, B. And I could just do it that way very easily in my notation software. And then they arrive on an A, E, C. So I need the A, the E's already there, and so is the C. They play exactly the same thing as the second violins in the next two chords of F, C, A, and G, E, C. So just with the strings here, So I can analyze this and we'll see if it works out with the strings, with the, with the winds. So here, so this is an F, 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 A, D, F, so that's an A, an F, and a D. So that means that this one, man, that's just moving a lot because I have, I'm not, have my fingers in the wrong place in the mouse. That's a D minor chord in second and first inversion. So that's D, um, that's a two, six. And then we have G's and uh, C, G, E, and C, and I'm gonna make people upset again. I'm gonna call that a, a one, six, four. It's a cadential six, four here. And then they leap up to uh, G and E, and then that's all in the same chord. And then on this eighth note, we get G, G, F, and D. So that's a G seven there. So let me, I'm gonna do this, C major over G. And then in this moment right here, this is a G7 chord. There's no B in this moment, which is fine. Uh, the rest of the notes are all there. And then we get another one, six, four. This is sort of a passing gesture of this, um, the, the G7 is a passing between, they go from E and G to C and E. So then we have G sharp, 
B and D, and that, my friend, is a seven of six. So G sharp, B and D. So then I learned this before, yep. And okay, and I'm gonna go slash, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna go like that. And okay. Boy, that's not really that's not really working out, is it? Okay. It's okay, it's because it's really big. Okay, so um, if you don't know your uh, um, secondary leading tone chords, the root this all means is that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't need that. Okay, what that all means is that this is the chord that happens on the seventh note of A. So if we go in A minor, where we're on the harmonic minor scale, A, C, E, G, um, I'm sorry, A, C, A, B, C, D, E, F natural, G sharp, A. And so the chord built on F sharp, on G sharp is G sharp, B, D. And so we expect that chord in A minor. And A minor is a chord that can happen in C major. And so it's a pretty common thing to happen in this key which Beethoven has been hinting that he might do something like this from earlier because there was a, a G sharp A in the melody back in measure four. So it's not surprising to happen here. It's also pretty common in this style to use this as a, de a deceptive, a passing thing in a deceptive resolution. You're expecting a cadence and he avoids it by going to A minor on the downbeat here, A, C, E. That's A's on the bottom. So A minor. So we get, in fact, the expected A minor chord. And that all sounds really nice, just so you get the idea of what this, what I've analyzed so far is like. Hmm. Sorry, I gotta make sure the melody goes up to C. There you go, and then this is F, F, C, F, F, C, and A. That's an F major chord. And that's, that's R4. And then this is G, G, C, E, and C. So that's another cadential 6-4. That's the one that's actually gonna help us get to the cadence. Okay, so. That's all of that. Now we're going to look at the woodwinds and brass, and we're going to determine if that was helpful. So the alternating chords means we're going to have to look, but here we go. So the timpani plays on beat two and beat four. C goes to C and then does on the downbeat, does a half note G, and then it repeats that two bars later. Is there a half note there? There is, in fact. Oh, these are all half notes. Does that make sense? Okay. Actually, are they half notes down there? Nope, they're not. They're quarter notes. Womp, womp. Okay. Uh, go away. Oh, please. I don't want everything to be blue. There we go. Thank you. Okay, the trumpets, this is in treble clef and they're in C, so it's the same as this, but it's up an octave. Uh, and one more on top of it. So and that happens twice. Okay, then the horns are also in treble clef in C, but everything sounds an octave lower. So they're playing these two C's right here. So we need an E and a G, an octave lower than written. I'm sorry, that B sounds cool, but it's not helpful. Then we have D and F um, two beats later, and then they they play. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rewrite this this way because I don't want to have to write a second voice. That's the same sound. I'm just gonna help me there. Okay. Then we have P, G, and C, and then they leap up. I'm gonna get rid of this tie. And that one too. Okay, and then this is E and G. And then they repeat the E G. And they go down. 
Okay, so the first three notes here, this E, G, that matches the first and second violins. They're just reversed this way. One's on top of the other, so they appear as thirds. But they go up to different notes here, which makes this a G sharp, D, B, D, F chord. So this actually ends up being a seven fully diminished seven of six. Okay, then everything else is the same so far. Nothing has changed um, in the Roman numerals. So then they play octave Cs, which are these two, these two, and then they hold this C and this C, and they tie over. I'm gonna write this C down here for my own, just for ease later. Okay. All right, from there we go up. Okay, the bassoons play octave, let's play both, they both play this C there. Then they play two Cs, that's this one. I'm just gonna have it again twice for my own visuals here. Then they play Fs, it's this one and this one. And then they go up to G, so this one here. Then they leap down an octave, so that's those two there playing eighth notes. The second moves to be with the first, so they play two Gs. And there's a G sharp and a B here. And that gives us our full G sharp B D F sound in the woodwinds. And then they move up to A and C. They lead down to octave A's. Then there's an F in octaves. And then they move up to G in octaves. And they do half notes. That's that G again. So I'm gonna I'm modifying some of what I'm doing here. Just it doesn't matter if it's repeated for our purposes. Okay. The clarinets are in C, so we don't have to transpose anything. They're just as written. So this C and E, this G, and then they play an E above this. That's the first clarinet. Then we have F and A. Then the C and E, they leap up to E, G, and they, they do the same thing in the same place as the horns. And then both of them leap up to that F there. So just in case you were wondering if that F is important, it is. Both clarinets are playing it with the first horn. And then they both resolve to the E in the next bar. Then there's C and E. Then they go up to F and A. And then they leap down to uh, C and E. The oboes do a fair amount of that just up the octave. So they do C and E, and then E and G, and then D and F. And then we have uh, C and E. I hit the wrong button. C and E. And they play this. Um, okay. E and G. E and G. And then D and F. And then they follow the, the strings here and go down to the B, the B, D. And then they both end up on C. Then C and E and then D and F, and then C and E. Okay, and then the flutes do that C and E. Then they leap up and they do the same thing as the oboes up an octave from there. So we get to do this all in a, another octave up. And I'll let you take the time to make sure that you know how to do lots of ledger lines up there to confirm that this is true, and it in fact is. So then here they both have C, and then they do C, E. Then they go up just as the oboes did to D and F, and then they end up on C and E again. All right, so notice we got some new information, like the chords that happen in the rests here. So this is a C, E, G chord. So that means we have one still. So that's a one chord, and then they'll play one chord. And then this 2-6 chord, they play this one. So there's the C's of the horn, I'm sorry, of the trumpets and the timpani. But everybody else is playing D, D and F, and A. So it's still D minor, but it's got that C in it. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put an asterisk here about the... 
I'm going to call it Brass Timpani Notes. And I'll say something about that. But still, it's still implying in the end still a 2 6, but I'm going to, I have to say something about that. Then that's all C major and that's, that all fits here. This is all D and F that fit here with the G. So there's no B that ever showed up for that G7 moment. Then the, that all fits for the credential, this other credential 6 4 that gets um, avoided, uh, the cadence gets avoided. Then we get that F that I mentioned, but everybody else is singing B and D, playing B and D. Then we do get our A minor chord. And then this time, they do play an A minor chord as well, so it's still 6. And then this 4 chord, instead of them playing 4, they play another 2, 6 with that 7th in it. So I'm going to call this, uh, so it's actually a 2, 6, 5. Uh, but it's actually a 4, 3. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what? Not really. Over here, same thing. Actually, the F is actually on the bottom this time, thank goodness. Um, thank you, second bassoon. Okay. So that's 265. So we go from 4 to 265 by adding a D and keeping the C. So this is what it is. So um, so notice there was a lot a lot of information we already knew. We just added a couple of things. So listen to this from that C chord arrival. keeps going from there. So what I want to note here about the temp this brass timpani thing is that as I said at an earlier session the there are limitations on how many notes the horns, the trumpets and the tr and the timpani can play. The timpanist only has two notes. C and G. The trumpets can only play certain pitches, which I outlined over here. Um, it's these ones. So they have, they have a C. The uh, this is, there. It's really hard to play the fundamental on a trumpet. So they got this C G C D E. That F's really flat, and an and a G. And the horns play this, but down an octave, and they have this lower note available to them. So, and you can you can get a little more fancy. Um, but it's it's hard it's, it's something they don't tend to ask for a lot. So so when you've got these limitations and you want to have at this time period with your natural trumpets and natural horns and your timpanist who really can't retune during the movement, it means you only and he only got two drums and he only has two drums. You have to you have to choose. What you're going to do when you have this thing and you want the brass to play in these alternating chords while you do a normal chord progression that doesn't always have C and G in them or E or whatever. You know, say you want to have, you can't have the trumpets play an A. They don't have it available to them. You can't get them to play a B. They don't have that either. So, I mean, they only got five notes and you don't want them to be screeching at the top of their register either. Right? So... So it means that what you your options there, so the C's sound great for the C major chord that happens. Oh yeah, great, beautiful. They're exactly in the right place for this world. But then for this, and it works out beautifully for the A minor chord too, that everybody can play their C, because it's the third of the chord. And then when the bassoon is really low on the F, on the bottom, you're not at all confused about what's going on. So everybody playing their C with this uh, D minor seven chord, this D minor and first inversion. It's not a, the, they're the people adding the seventh, but the seventh doesn't resolve and he doesn't need to here because you got the cadential six four chord and the C holds on. But in the earlier instance of this, the first time it happens, 
and the, the bassoons are not that low. They're playing higher up. There's no, there's no note below the timpani here to signal that the, the timpani note isn't the root of the chord. Although all the part writing of everybody else matches the 265, the, I'm sorry, the 2-6 of everybody else is playing a 2-6 chord, a D minor chord with an F on the bottom. And that's going to go to a C major chord in first inversion. And so, luckily, if you add a C, you're just adding the seventh of the chord. But it's not going to resolve because the, trump the trumpets can't play a B. So, and luckily the B isn't the next thing. So what you have here is that it's more important to Beethoven that the chord is two, is this D minor sound. And then he knows that he can just have this, the, having them all play C won't sound that bad. It'll make some sense. And, but he's going to have to break a couple of rules about how everybody else would do things because he's got such a limited couple of instruments playing should note that the horns play the, the C's the second two times as well, where it's a little bit, part rings a little bit better. So this is like a, so, you know, it's basically saying like, well, it's the closest thing I got available, and okay, and nobody's, nobody's going to bat an eye at this, because this is pretty standard. Um, you know, you can just have them just, it's more important that they help the volume of this moment than that they're playing exactly the best note for the chord and all the other stuff you learned otherwise. So this is an orchestrational thing about dealing with these instruments 200 years ago. Luckily, nowadays, you can have the timpanist can just put his foot on the pedal and change the note with no problem, stick his ear nearby, get to the right place, pam, you know, hit it. And the trumpets have, you know, a fully chromatic thing and they have practiced for a long time to play soft anywhere. So, Trump players were also good 200 years ago. <laughs> anyway, so sometimes the the trumpets and timpani, and sometimes even the horns in um, music from say the 1800s and in this early 1900s period before the advent of everybody has valves, are going to sometimes play interesting notes that don't necessarily follow all of the other patterns that you expect. From the way that you would learn how to write music otherwise because of the limitations of the instruments they had available so so it's really just a two six chord and those c's are playing are just let's have let's have the brass let's have the trumpets and the the trumpets and the timpani play there because we need them to for the texture so that's enough for today I've only gone 10 minutes over my scheduled time that I um, set for myself. Not that anybody else is paying attention. Actually, got a couple of people watching. Thank you for watching this. I'm grateful that anyone's paying attention to this at all. Um, I hope that this was helpful. Um, so tomorrow at uh, 3 o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Time, I'll be back um, talking about the a little bit about something about the Carabini D Major Symphony from 1815. Uh, then some about the opening of the last movement of Brahms' fourth symphony. And then in the second hour, we'll pick up right from here with Beethoven 1 and continue with the bar by bar. I'll get to the end of the introduction, and then we'll write something that kind of uses this kind of alternating idea and goes through some basic uh, chord progressions like this and this lovely uh, secondary dominant passage of going from cadential 6-4 and instead of going to five, you go to uh, you go you the bass slides up to G sharp to get to A. Again, a very common pattern. So sounds really cool. It's very useful. So that's what we'll do tomorrow. Otherwise, thanks for watching. This is Music Corner, our symphonizing project, episode four. I'm David Colma. Have a great day. <laughs>